very good morning to everyone tuning in to this live breakfast at Faculty of Medicine. My name is Professor Dr. Shahrul Bahia Kamaruzaman. I'm a consultant geriatrician here at the Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine. Now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the last breakfast at FOM of 2020. Now, this session truly captures our spirit of interdisciplinary collaboration of Faculty of Medicine. And this is with the title of Sarcopenia and Cancer and the Elderly Patients, Pushing the Boundaries of Colorectal Cancer Care in a within a Trimodal Approach. This morning, we have four experts in their field. But before I introduce them, let me introduce uh, the topic. Now, colorectal cancer is the second most common cancer in Malaysia. The majority that are affected are elderly. The challenges in treating colorectal cancer effectively range from multiple comorbidity and geriatric syndromes like sarcopenia, which literally means a reduction in muscle mass, strength and performance. Now our four speakers will draw parallels to allowing for a elderly patient becoming fit for surgery. And this is with piloting a very strategic multidisciplinary program of rehabilitation. The four speakers that we have in store are Dr. Terence Teng Inwe. Now, he will set the scene of what sarcopenia is about. He's a consultant geriatrician from the Geriatric Unit Department of Medicine. Talking about the impact of surgical care is Professor Kong Tat Lung. The intervention with regards to specific patient exercise program and rehabilitation post-surgery is Professor Naha. And last but not least is Professor Hazrin, who is our nutritional expert, as well as public health expert. And he will talk about sarcopenic obesity and the nutritional interventions that should be related to post-op recovery in any patient who will undergo operations. Now, all four speakers will draw parallels on trying to make an elderly person fit for surgery by it, it would be like training someone for um, an athlete, an athletic event, and the hurdles that they will have to go through prior to the operation and in their post-op recovery. Now, without further ado, uh, let me please introduce our first speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Terence Teng Inwe, and uh, he will speak on uh, sarcopenia and setting the scene of what it means to the older person. All right, thank you very much, Prof. Sharo. So I'm going to say the phrase of 2020, which is, can you hear me and can you see my slides? I will take that as yes. Okay, so uh, my name is Terence. I'm a geriatrician, and my task today is to very much set the scene uh, for today's webinar. And I cannot think of a better way of setting the scene than to introduce you to this pretty amazing woman. Now, her name is Madonna Bude, and I hope I got her last name pronounced correctly. Now, what's impressive about uh, Madonna Bude is not just that she's a nun, at the age of 82 years, she became the oldest woman to complete an Ironman challenge. Now, what is an Ironman, you ask? Well, it's like uh, an extended triathlon, a triathlon on steroids, essentially. So uh, she would have had to run, uh, sorry, swim just under uh, four kilometers. She would have had to cycle 180 kilometers. And then she would have to top it off by running 42.2 kilometers. And she did that at the very young age of 82. Now, what's made this even more impressive was when asked about her achievements, she said she only started running properly when she was 48 years old, which sort of gives me a bit of hope, really, if I aim to do my Ironman challenge at the right old age of 80. But this is an example of someone who has maintained an impressive muscle function and muscle ability into the later, late, later years of your life. The very opposite of sarcopenia. Now, what is sarcopenia then? It's not just about muscle shrinking. It's not about a reduction in strength. 
it's got an ICD-10 diagnostic code. And what it alludes to is a multi-domain deficit within muscle function. So you have a reduction in muscle mass and there is either a reduction in muscle strength, performance, or both. And sarcopenia encompasses all these different, different muscle domain deficits. Now, we're still not entirely clear um, the underlying pathophysiology that leads to the development of sarcopenia. We know that there are multiple pathways that contribute to its development, and we hope that one day one of these pathways would be a therapeutic target. But what we do know for now is that the drivers behind sarcopenia are very much a pro-inflammatory state, a degree of inactivity, and undernutrition, which is why you're going to hear about later on in this webinar how we are targeting these very specific areas to try and tackle this problem of sarcopenia. Now, the Asian Working Group for Sarcopenia has come up with a diagnostic algorithm, some sort of consensus to how we say whether someone has sarcopenia or not. Uh, and they've used uh, certainly uh, pre specified cutoff thresholds to help with achieving that diagnosis. So it begins very much with an assessment of grip strength uh, using a handheld dynamo meter and an assessment of the physical performance, which could be either a six meter walking test, how many quickly they can transfer from chair to a standing position or a more robust assessment tool called a short physical performance battery test. And if they were to cross any of these cutoff thresholds, then an assessment of muscle mass is done using either DEXA or a BIA machine. And again, you can see on the screen the pre specified cutoff threshold. And achieving this leads to a diagnosis of sarcopenia. And the reference is there for you to look at at a later time. What the Asian Working Group for Sarcopenia has also gone on to say is that some of these individual muscle domains, whether it's grip strength or walking speed, could itself be used as a screening mechanism, picking people up proactively, whether they have sarcopenia or not. Uh, that's whether you test for your grip strength or you screen using a six meter walk test. But either way, uh, using these different measures to screen for sarcopenia does involve uh, using some form of equipment uh, and also some form of training, which is why the AWGS and its European counterparts and many uh, international stakeholders support and so they support the use of this particular questionnaire. And it's a pretty simple questionnaire with five different components to it. It's called SAF-F. And a score of four or more than four is highly predictive of someone who has sarcopenia or is at risk of sarcopenia. And again, the references are at the bottom. A few points about sarcopenia. Its prevalence has been reported to be somewhere between seven to 12% uh, among community dwellers using the AWGS criteria. But when we look at specific clinical areas where a high proportion of older people are cared for, that number goes up. And many studies report the in-hospital prevalence, so we're talking about uh, acute emergency admission to hospital, prevalence of sarcopenia is somewhere between one in four to one in three. Who's more likely to develop sarcopenia? Older age, comorbid conditions such as uh, diabetes, COPD, chronic kidney disease, being inactive, being mobile, and being undernourished are strong associate factors for the development of sarcopenia. And however you look at it, sarcopenia itself is an independent risk factor for poor healthcare outcomes. Uh, they have higher healthcare utilization, quality of life is slower, more likely to report functional decline, ill health falls, and have poor survival. And if you take nothing away from my presentation, um, remember point four. We have a condition here that is highly prevalent. 
we have a condition that is associated with worst outcomes. What we need to also bear in mind is that we have evidence of what we can do about them. We have growing evidence and certainly ongoing research to how we can modify sarcopenia with the hope of influencing their poor healthcare outcomes, which we will hear about a little bit later. But you see, the older person don't just only have sarcopenia. More than often than not, they are frail, they have problems with polypharmacy, multimorbidity, disability and malnutrition. Which is why I want to take this opportunity to talk about very briefly in through one slide how specialist geriatric medicine could work collaboratively with surgical teams to look after older people undergoing surgery and that's whether in the elective or within the emergency setting and you can see just a snapshot of what's published in recent years supporting such a co-management model of care with deliverable benefits and certainly this becomes a collaboration that I feel is certainly worth pursuing locally in the formal sense at some point in the near future. So I hope I've set the scene and I'm just going to add my little bit here very much in the same way as I started it by introducing to you to uh, a couple of pretty inspirational people. Now the gentleman at the top there is uh, Mr. Hiromu Inada who is the oldest person to complete an Ironman challenge and he did it at the age of 85 years old. Uh, and just to give it some context, he did it all, the running, the swimming, the cycling, and the running, all within just under 17 hours. Okay. And the gentleman at the bottom is Mr. Singh, who at the age of 100 years uh, completed his uh, marathon. So anyway, thank you very much. And I'm going to hand you back over to Prof. Sharo. Thank you very much, Dr. Terence. That was truly inspiring. I mean, the lady at the beginning and the one at the end are sort of pictures that I always have in mind, especially the marathon runners. But the, in the community we have in Malaysia, I think there are very many champions that if you look around, that they, they, are, they are present between us. And it'd be really good to find out and tap into what makes them uh, champions of aging uh, in our community. and. Um, and without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, inform the audience here that um, to pose your questions to each of the speakers on our chat group, and um, I will try and address them all at the end. Um, so on to our next speaker. Now, Associate Professor Dr. Kong Tat Lun is our consultant general surgeon, as well as colorectal surgeon. He's the head of the colorectal uh, unit in Department of Surgery at our faculty at UM. And he will be uh, our next speaker to look at the surgical aspects of colorectal cancer care. And back to you, Prof. Gong. Thank you very much, Prof. Sharo, for the introduction. And I have to say thank you very much again to um, everyone for joining us this morning. Um, and I have to commend um, Terence for a fantastic introduction. And this really makes my life a lot easier to introduce the concept. So I'm just going to share with you my slides. Um, but I'm not really enlarge screen. Okay. Sorry, whilst uh, we are dealing with a few um, technical issues here, um, you probably would wonder what a colorectal surgeon is doing um, trying to meddle with something which is um, so highly technical um, to do with sarcopenia. Thank you. And essentially, I've come to realize that um, a huge portion of my patients actually are elderly. Um, as we age, uh, we obviously develop degenerative conditions and, and also, unfortunately, malignancies. And um, if I was to show you that 
Um, if we look at a population um, over the age of 65, over half of us uh, will require surgery at some point. And in UMMC, um, our data shows that um, about 60% of, of our elective colorectal cancer surgery um, are for the people aged above 65. So I do see quite a few elderly patients in my clinic. But I have to say that not all elderly patients are homogeneous. So as um, Terence has alluded to, you have people like this who are extreme athletes. They can run about 100 meters in 12 to 13 seconds, and they participate in this Huntsman Series World Athletic event um, on a two yearly basis. But what we normally see in our clinic are people more like this, where they have, uh, they're functional, they're able to do daily house chores. Um, and then you have the other extreme where you have um, elderly patients who are debilitated, who are in bed most of the time. Now, why is it important to determine functional status of patients, especially for being a surgeon? We know that functional status and comorbidities are highly correlated with patient outcome. So if I was to show you this study here in Journal of Cancer, this is a fairly large retrospective study um, looking at the various um, parameters that may predispose a patient um, to um, poorer outcomes after surgery. You can see that functional status strongly correlates with poor outcome. So the outcome here is mortality within three months of surgery. And for those who are not acquainted to what we call the ECOG scale or the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group scale, this is a scale that, is, uh, that gives you a, a, it's more like a symptom-based um, measure of a patient's functional status. And you can actually determine their function from one zero to four, zero and one meaning they really have very good functional status, they're able to work and they're able to do all activities of daily living. And on the other hand, ECOG 4 score will be for that patient that I showed you earlier with who had debilitated and remains in bed for more than 50% of the time. And you can see on this table very clearly that those who score zero to one have very low mortality, but compared to those who have an ECOG score four, but they have got a much higher risk of dying within three months of surgery. Now, it seems like this score is very simple. It's basically asking a patient in clinic what they're capable of doing. But in reality, I think all of you could relate that some patients may not be very reliable in their history. So they may seem to tell you that they are capable of doing everything at home. They're able to climb two flights of stairs and they're completely independent. But then when you actually physically see their exercise tolerance, i.e. watch them maybe climb a flight of stairs, you realize that they may not be able to even climb half a flight of stairs. So this is the challenge I've been encountering is that I find that the ECOG scale is helpful at times when patients can give me a reliable history, but I just find that it is not very useful sometimes in my clinical practice. So therefore it means that we need to find a more reliable and more robust and more reproducible way of trying to identify which elderly patients are at particularly high risk of post-operative morbidity and mortality. Because if we can identify these patients early, then I could we can institute some interventions to try to reduce the likelihood of poorer outcome. And also it also has a huge impact on their perioperative care. So which is why I, we thought long and hard about this. And I have to say that, you know, sometimes when you walk down a long corridor from the parking at the faculty to your office, 
you kind of think, gosh, it's going to be another stroll. But I have to say the silver lining is that I've met many, many people in UM down that corridor. And it's incredible how everyone seems to have their niche areas. And it's only by talking do you actually tap into the expertise of others and you realize that collaboration is certainly the way forward. Um, so we are now starting to look at sarcopenia as being a potential predictor of morbidity and mortality. So the reason for why we use sarcopenia rather than just basically using the ECOG score solely and alone is because sarcopenia can be determined in various ways. And one of the ways that we are currently looking at is using CT scans to look at the, the musculature at the L3 level. Because all our colorectal cancer patients are going to undergo staging CTs anyway, this will allow us a good way of screening patients who are particularly high risk um, based on the um, prognostic indicator, i.e. sarcopenia. So if you to look across the board, in colorectal cancer, we think about 12 to 16% of patients with colorectal cancer are sarcopenic. And we are collaborating with um, a fellow friend of ours in Hong Kong, and his early studies showed that about 25% of his patients above the age of 65 has sarcopenia. I have to say that this, this, um, di this um, uh, how we determine sarcopenia and how we diagnose it can vary depending on countries. And the cutoff point that um, Terence showed you was the Asian population. And there have been studies elsewhere on the Caucasian population where the cutoff points are very different. So which is therefore explains why there's a such a wide range of patients who are supposedly deemed sarcopenic. And the diagram on the right basically shows all the various reasons for why patients develop sarcopenia uh, when they're elderly for one. And secondly, if they have cancer, not only do they have a natural aging process causing sarcopenia, but when they have cancer, they have cancer related and treatment related reasons for why sarcopenia is then accelerated. We know from very good studies that sarcopenia is a predictor for poorer outcome. What I mean by that is that patients who have sarcopenia have increased post-operative morbidity, mortality, intolerance to chemotherapy, and as a result, all in all, altogether, they have overall poorer oncological outcomes. So we have some good data here. So this study was done fairly recently in 2015, looking at sarcopenia and how that predicts complications after surgery for colorectal cancer. This is a prospective cohort study of, involving 142 patients. And clearly those who are sarcopenic, as you can see in this prospective cohort study are generally more elderly. When we looked at complications as a whole, you can see that proportionally patients who are sarcopenic are more likely to develop infectious complications and post-operative complications. So sorry for the busy slide here, but I think it's important because this is one of the few um, meta-analysis looking at sarcopenia as a predictor of prognosis for patients undergoing colorectal cancer surgery um, involving 12 studies and accumulating 5,337 patients. Now you can see that on the uh, forest plots, they looked at hospital stay, total post-operative morbidity, mortality, infection, and an osmotic leak. And amongst all those parameters, hospital stay, morbidity, mortality, and infection were significantly higher in patients with sarcopenia. Now, for those colorectal surgeons of you out there wondering what is the effect of sarcopenia on an asthmatic leak, this apparently shows that there is no significant difference, but I have to hazard that the numbers here are relatively small. Um, and also the events are small. So it means that you can still offer um, anastomosis. It shouldn't be a contraindication, but clearly the, the role of how you manage these patients has to be tailored. And what about long-term outcome? 
even if this periopter period went well, and you have a patient who is um, who is recovered and returned back home, even then those patients who have sarcopenia generally have poorer long-term survival. So this retrospective study of 968 patients clearly demonstrate that those who are sarcopenic have a generally poorer prognosis in terms of overall survival. They have a poorer overall recurrence-free survival and cancer-specific survival. So the reason for me to tell you this is because patient selection is key. You know that you're going to be performing a fairly invasive procedure on a patient who already has malignancy in an elderly group of people. And the last thing you want is to subject a patient to unnecessary intervention who may, which may shorten their life, give them poor quality of life. And at the same time, they will not survive for long after surgery, despite having successful curative surgery. So which is why it's very important to work together in the group to decide which patients are the ones that you should fight for and select best for curative intent and be reasonable and be who you think are not. Which is why I strongly am very, um, I'm a proponent of working collaboratively with other colleagues and try to identify patients who are supposedly fit for surgery. And even if they're fit for surgery, I think you should actually train these patients like an athlete, as was um, Terence mentioned before, because by making them fitter, then hopefully they'll be able to weather through the surgical stress and the periopsid period. So with that, I'm just going to end there. I'm just going to hand it back to Prof. Sharo. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Kong. That was very enlightening indeed. And certainly our long corridor in Faculty of Medicine does inspire us to actually speak to each other and find out what we're doing. So it's a very friendly corridor indeed. And um, to quote you as uh, saying, train a patient like an athlete, uh, we go on to our next expert, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Mohamed Naha Azmi Mohamed. Uh, he's consultant sports medicine physician and the head of the sports medicine unit here at the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, Prof. Naha will be talking about uh, pre-rehabilitation, pre-surgery rehabilitation, and uh, what to do to prepare to be fit for surgery. Uh, welcome, Prof. Naha. Thank you, uh, Prof. Sharo, for the introduction. Um, hold on, let me share. Uh, and, okay, all right, okay. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Prof. Kong for getting me involved in this very important uh, collaboration in looking at uh, how to make patients uh, fit prior to the um, prior to operation or uh, before surgery. So as what he had mentioned, um, so make patient as an athlete, of course, there's a limitation that you have to think about uh, for those that initially not even um, uh, active at all and try to make them fit at the very beginning is very challenging. And of course, you need a time frame. But then the problem is when patients with cancer, you have very limit, limited time. So it's, uh, you know, you have to balance out how to go about and uh, give the best to make sure that before patient goes for the operation and they are much fitter compared to previously when they first seen in the clinic. So uh, let me start with um, very uh, basic uh, um, definitions of physical activity. I'm sure everybody knows about this, but bodily movement and encompass uh, compasses of exercise, sports and physical activities performed as part of daily living and exercise is a, a subcategory of physical activity and physical function is the capacity of an individual to perform the physical activities of daily living. Okay, just if you have seen earlier, um, Dr. Terence has introduced uh, people from overseas, even uh, uh, just now, uh, Prof. Kong introduced uh, another uh, international 
athletes. So I'm proudly want to introduce you our own athletes. Uh, if you can see that uh, uh, Prof Tengku Sara itself. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to show everybody how active you are at your uh, experience age, golden age. Okay, and she's tap dancing, which is actually a, 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 a difficult, uh, a, 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 what do you call that, dance to perform. I'm, 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 I'm very, uh, uh, what do you call that, um, truly admire uh, her energy and inspired me personally. And if you can see besides me, uh, a, a man who always I admire most, um, he started to pull me into a road run, even though I'm uh, basically a runner, but I've never run road run. And he started uh, uh, at that point of time, he's at the age of 60, uh, coaching me while I'm at the age of 40. And now he's already 70 and he's still running. Uh, five came about an hour time, so which is actually for 70 years old is a uh, were uh, uh, outstanding. So uh, looking at, we need to look at physical fitness is a state of health and well-being and more specifically the ability to perform aspect of sports or, uh, sports or occupations or even daily activities, what uh, Prof. Komet mentioned earlier. So it's uh, it encompasses of, you know, proper nutrition, moderate vigorous physical exercise and sufficient rest. Of course, when you're talking about uh, moderate vigorous physical activity, uh, that's always been the recommendation. But looking at the patients as individual uh, or a person as individual, you have different level of uh, activity level among ourselves. So it's uh, again a challenging in terms of how you going to encourage or prescribe a program. You may have a general so-called template in terms of uh, prescribing or uh, making a plan or program to the individual, but again, to implement it is uh, is challenging because uh, you need to look at how the level of the person itself in terms of physical activity level and how much commitment that the person can give and the access uh, to any facilities or something that may uh, assist them to improve their fitness level. So basically, these are the component of um, physical fitness co component of, of course, the cardio respiratory fitness, strength, power, speed, as what uh, Dr. Terence mentioned earlier, um, muscle strength of, uh, and, and flexibility. These are all uh, physical fitness component. Okay, now, again, the functional decline as uh, a cause of the disease or age or a combination of factors can possibly be prevented by incorporating pre-operative exercise therapy or you can call it pre-conditioning or you can call it prehabilitation program. So that's where uh, for the past two years, Prof Kong, um, we have in, in, in communication, try to how to improve patients before going for operation and make sure that uh, the outcome of the operation will be benefits for patient itself. Of course, in the end of the day, you would like to have a good outcome in terms of uh, stay, uh, recovery of patient post-operatively. So the purpose is to maintain physical activity in the course of a major life event like surgery and the possibility to reduce morbidity and mortality after surgery. In case of elective surgery, which is where uh, there's a plan, uh, a proper discussion between both, between, uh, um, okay, uh, between all parties in terms of, you know, the, with the surgeon, uh, what we want to achieve and how much we want to uh, expect in terms of um, um, uh, the results that are going to outcome. Um, of uh, patients undergoing a procedure. So preoperatively physical function is an independent predictor of the postoperative cost in terms of uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, functional decline is often seen as a result of decreased physical activity before, uh, during 
and even after hospitalization and after surgery. So, you know, um, even prolonged stay, which will also contribute in terms of muscle mass or muscle wasting, cardiopulmonary deconditioning and pulmonary complication and psychological distress. So to show that um, um, pre-surgical exercise may benefit uh, patients through a positive effects on function and physical capacity, so, uh, which is actually important uh, if you can introduce uh, two uh, patients which are eligible and uh, uh, can come for the so-called preconditioning and hopefully can benefit um, in terms of uh, uh, results uh, after uh, going through preconditioning. So basically what is preconditioning? Uh, prepare the body for surgery and facilities, uh, facilitate a better outcome after the surgical intervention. When muscle, bones, and joint are in optimum condition before the procedure, the impact of the inevitable muscle loss and joint stiffness is minimized postoperatively. Okay, so the aim, a strong, the stronger a person is going into a surgery, a better chance of easier and faster recovery, uh, regain function and return to their daily life faster. This also helps promote uh, correct movement patterns and minimize compensatory movement like leaning and even weight bearing and so on and so forth. So guideline, when we want to start, okay, when, how long? At least six weeks prior to the surgery, which is actually, of course, between four to six weeks. And it depends on uh, the individual itself, the, the, the current physical activity level, and how much they can uh, 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 or comply and commit in terms of the program that being given. So, uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, if, you are, if the patient is not at all at their best level, so to get the best between a short period of time is very, very challenging and difficult. So, and for, furthermore, you have to start slow before you start introducing any form of uh, uh, physical intervention. So, you need to gradually increase intensity or increase how many times a week. Because sometimes when you introduce, you cannot just simply say, oh, you need to start three uh, times a week of 30 minutes uh, just to uh, comply with the recommendation of uh, by the WHO, 150 minutes per week. Even now, the WHO has recommended to start at any point of time with even at this move to encourage people to uh, increase their physical activity level. But then for this uh, condition for patient undergoing uh, uh, operation, so we need to, if we start just a little move, so how long we need to uh, spend time for them to get into their fitness level. So, post-surgical discharge, uh, compensated activities, collaboration, of course, this is where we are working together among uh, all uh, disciplines to ensure that the patient get the very best benefits. In terms of the evaluation, of course, we're looking at the cardiorespiratory fitness assessment, uh, muscle and joint strength, which I think uh, uh, earlier uh, Dr. Uh, Terence has mentioned in terms of uh, the assessment of sarcopenia. So those part of assessment also incorporate is what the, we, uh, we are assessing and when, if let's say patients undergoing a preconditioning period, that's where we're going to monitor them. Of course, ideally, the ideal uh, assessment that we do, we would like to do is cardiopulmonary exercise test, but of course, not all center will have. That's where they also recommended to do a six minute walk test. So just to tell you uh, uh, the cardiopulmonary exercise test that we have in our setting, uh, most of the time for patients, we will do cycling. Uh, they will sit on a recumbent bicycle and then we will ask them to uh, wear masks that where we will measure the uh, uh, their respiratory uh, output carbon dioxide oxygen even uh, until uh, uh, cellular level 
So if patient unable to cycle, then we have other option, okay, uh, with arm ergometry. So how soon? As I mentioned earlier, uh, the range between four to six weeks. But yeah, you know, when people sending uh, would like to send patients to optimize, and then sometimes I re we receive a referral where patients going for operation the next week, which is actually, you know, what, what is the idea of a re referral to if you want to optimize, if you couldn't see the so-called outcome that we would like to achieve, if you send patient less than the recommendation. So it will be beneficial for patient if you want to refer to us and would like patients to achieve the, the up, utmost um, uh, uh, benefits from the preconditioning. So it should be uh, the recommendation, a recommended time, time frame, which they will benefit from it. So we will design, of course, definitely we will design, but principle is like normal, uh, everybody, patients also, uh, program will be designed individually. You may have the, uh, a template uh, to guide, but when to start with, sometimes you just, you to encourage them to start from something, even a uh, simple walking, maybe all this while they never walk at all, just most of the time on a couch or on, you know, sitting all the time. Even I have quite a number of patients where they talking about, you know, walking, even walking is a bit challenging for them. So again, like ask them to shift from a place to another place within short period of time. So that will start to in increase in terms of the physical activity level and give them a, time, a, 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 dura a, a distance that they will achieve within their limits and improve gradually. So it's not like as simple as you, you want them, okay, within these six weeks, you need to achieve this. So it's, it's really challenging for some patients, for some individual, which they, if they are, have not involved in any form of physical activity. So we still follow the uh, common uh, uh, formula, what we call frequency, intensity, time, and time. So these are the, the, the normal term that we use, but of course, in terms of implementing to uh, patients will be very individual or even if we ourselves, if you want to start an exercise, we have to do accordingly how much we can do at any point of time and increase gradually. So there are two components that the, 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 the dominant component, which is the aerobic type of exercise, which I've uh, showed earlier. And then now the, uh, the, the other important component that which most of people uh, neglect uh, in terms of, oh, maybe it's not necessary, but even in current uh, guideline by WHO, which uh, announced uh, last month, 26th of November, uh, they, they emphasize on the add-on strengthening exercise. It can be your body weight, it can be an added weight with dumbbell resistant and uh, go to the gym. So program design uh, is important. And then secondly, uh, 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 to add on the endurance. But again, for those that have not been active, you need to start something is better than nothing at all. So the evidence suggests that with respect of length of training. So this is actually recommendation and supposedly, you know, if to see a result, a good significant result of improvement, it will take at least two, 12 weeks. But because of our limitation in terms of because of patient conditions and time frame given by the surgeon. So we have to try to accommodate, but of course, not as low as less than four weeks. Okay. So um, uh, try to sum up. So uh, pre-surgery rehabilitation plan will create patient's strong foundation for rapid recovery can be effective for uh, reducing post-operative complication rates and length of hospital stay after cardiac or abdominal surgery. Um, I think that's all from me now. Uh, go back to Prof. Sharu. Thank you, Prof. Naha. Um, it does um, beg the question of, you know, uh, something is better than nothing and, you know, you're never too old to start. And um, yeah. certain types of specific uh, exercises, especially resistance uh, type exercises are more, far more beneficial in older people to benefit muscle. Now on to the second part, uh, sorry, the second intervention um, 
part of the talk is uh, by Associate Professor Dr. Hazrin Abdul Majid. He is the head of Center for Population Health and R&D uh, from the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine. Now he's our nutritional expert. And without further ado, I would like to invite him to be our next and last speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? So, if it's yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Prof. Sharul uh, for a kind introduction and also all other eminent speakers who are actually set the scene earlier than me. Uh, and thanks, Doug, for actually inviting me via the corridor. And I guess that is a very good place or spot for us to have our synapse working. So, let me share first my slide. Right, so I was given a task to talk about quite broadly from the sarcopenia obesity and I will focus more from the dietary perspectives. Um, as you know, for Malaysia, Malaysia is actually a really food haven. So pretty much people will try as much as possible um, to eat and when they can. But I like when the set of scene just now to talk about to prepare our patients to be fit for surgery requires us to actually give them both nutrition, uh, physical activity and as well as nutritionally. So this is going to be my outline for presentations. And let me just briefly talk from the beginning of psychopenic obesity. And you know, for Malaysia, as I mentioned to you, we are, um, we are basically have a lot of food. We have no problems. In fact, we have more problem with wastage. Um, we are the champion for obesity for adults. And we are also the runner up for, um, uh, for children in terms of obesity. Yet when we look into that, we start to realize, hmm, is that something wrong with us that is actually we continuously, maybe from younger to adults that we remain as inactive and also being overweight obese. So commonly used uh, to measure um, overweight obese is using the WHO um, cutoff point. But looking at that, when you look from the large meta-analysis of 200,000 individuals, for those who are above 65 years old, they show the U-shaped relationship between BMI and mortality. And don't be alarmed because what they saw, the lowest risk uh, seen for those who are BMI between 24 and 30, uh, and 30. But you have exceeded to actually having more problems uh, when it comes to mortality when you exceeded 33. Thus, that's where we start to ask ourselves, is it just the BMI to look for? And obviously most of you have seen just now is more than BMI and definitely waist circumference and other what we call it measurements is needed to look into our muscle mass. Uh, pretty much as we are aging, we'll start to lose our muscle, what we eat, if we are eating the same, like we are young, that excess energy will be part of obesity development and at the same time, it will lead to all insulin resistance as well as in the future for your cardiometabolic diseases. So just a recap, because none of them show actually, for the body composition, if you look into it, you can see this is how much for the whole, rather than just focusing on our weight, you have your fat-free mass and fat mass. Um, Dr. Terence earlier on have put for the uh, uh, pinia, um what we call it, uh, assessment. And this would be the reference methods that we normally will come across and can be used if you plan to use it also either clinically or for those who plan to do some dietary intervention which want to incorporate. As we can see, as an adipose tissue, if you can look into this diagram here, where you look into the lens of uh, tissue mass, you can see all this number added from number two to number four. And if you're looking for more on a fat-free mass, these are the numbers to be added from this diagram. And everybody had mentioned just now how important that we have to move to be fit, to try our best. That goes the same with the diet as well. But with muscle, why is our topic today is important? Because we are trying to prevent sarcopenia during elderly, or if you already have um, a sarcopenia when you're um, elderly, how you're actually going to minimize them to make it even from even worse. So the evaluation of muscle mass, it can be two, by objective measurement, you're using from your, uh, uh, what we call it, CT scanning, MRI, uh, and few others. And uh, most of the times, in terms of nutrition, 
we also use with the hand grip strength not to uh, uh, because that will be the most feasible to actually use but there are a few other techniques that you can use as well but for subjective measurement some people also have used a screening tool that is already validated to look into uh, evaluation of risk assessment for them for having sarcopenia or not so let me dwell a little bit about the muscle strength. So this is how the, muscle, uh, the grip strength will look like by using the hand dynamometry. And it's considered one of the reference standard. And it's also showing from the functional independence where uh, Professor Naha just now mentioned a little bit about, it's very important to look into all these patients who slowly will having problems, uh, uh, functional disabilities. And that's why when we look into nutrition, it's look to have some uh, what we call objective indicator to look at it. And let me just bring you a little bit, um, how does the Malaysian looks like or their muscle strength to begin with? This is just a snapshot from a work that we did, but unfortunately this is actually mostly from adolescents. And let me just set the scene in terms of to say, what do we notice from our muscle strength when, they, when we were young or from our current generation when they were young? So this is work done uh, from the Big My Heart study that is actually part of uh, my uh, PhD students before, uh, AICA. We look into how does diet, physical activity going to influence longitudinally in terms of muscle strength. And what do we notice? In terms of for male, the increment when they are age of 13 to 17, there's going to be a 10 kilogram of increase in strength. But in comparison to female, the increment of their muscle strength is um, what we call it slightly lower. And we did all those um, analysis and what do we discover from the GEE? We discovered that with higher protein intake and carbohydrate intake among males was associated with higher muscular strength. However, when you are, but not observed in females, nutrition and physical activity focusing on strength building are really required from the young. So when we look into this, um, we really have to see individualized info intervention actually, not just by to look for everybody, either it's male or female, it's the same amount to be given. I will put my summary up later, but just to set the scene to show you, it's actually very important to actually look into from males and females point of view when we are doing nutritional intervention. And why do we actually using for hand grip strength? It has been shown that hand grip strength itself is a risk indicator for type 2 diabetes from this systematic review. And some people actually have also uh, um, saying we have difficulties to look into what would be the basis of hand grip strength. It's important for those who plan to do some of the nutritional study um, is looking into what would be the set of value is there. And I would like to refer to this big nice paper that has been done by Leong's group, which is called the Pure Study, looking into uh, the hand grip strength from South Asia up until to the northern, uh, to the European counterpart. And they actually put here, it needs to be interpreted using region or ethnic specific reference ranges. Why do I say that? If you look into here, Malaysia participated in this study, you look from our muscle strength, when we are about 35 for female, it's 23, but then decreased to 22, 20, 18. This is almost similar to the one I discovered for female when they are adolescent. And then for men, it's actually from 40 as we grow older, 37, 33. So you can see that shows some signal there if you want to use for muscle strength in part of your intervention. There you go. So how about nutrition in increasing muscle strength? Unfortunately, when I look into as an overall, whether there is some specific for uh, preparing colorectal cancer or uh, surgery, most of them are focusing either you are using for uh, colorectal surgery, do you use um, with, um, or uh, what we call it, the enhanced, you're giving uh, uh, glucose uh, drinks. And then at the same time, when you are also try to look into um, others in terms of rehabilitative, it's quite few. It doesn't really focus on a much uh, latest information. And thus, I need to actually refer back to the protein intake exercise for optimal muscle function from the Eastman group that was published a few years back. And what do they discover for this group in terms of protein requirement? As we know, the patient's lower protein intake, you see, when we are talking from Malaysians, point of view of food intake, they might actually have a lot of um, energy dense food. When I say energy dense foods, it's all fried, it's all sugary, but you have to remember we might meet the energy 
but we not need the quality of the diet itself. So you can see our lower protein intake and thus include our lower protein intake due to either genetic predisposition, physiological changes, our polypharmacy in terms of medications that we are having. As Naha mentioned, we are really not active and as well as socioeconomic conditions because once you are actually having marginal economy, you might also uh, uh, prevent you to have a proper uh, times of uh, food. But nevertheless, that doesn't inhibit you to choose the good options of food as well, plus with your education. So we know the demands when you are uh, uh, your demands is higher if you're planning to go for surgery or even though to maintain healthy status because the higher protein needs also leads to when you are actually having disease-related protein and you have decreased muscle perfusion and so many factors that makes you having higher protein requirements. And what does this tell us? So basically, in terms of dietary protein intake, so what we notice is older adults have greater protein needs to compensate for anabolic resistance and hypermetabolic disease. And also their optimal intake is between one to 1.5 gram. You see, this is a suggestion based on the evidence. However, it's coming back to us as, as healthcare professionals, as a team that we envisage to look for, is looking at what the patients currently intake. Because if the intake is too much, you also need to look into whether it's need to cut down because normally all this food doesn't come just as a protein. It's also come with fat because it's going to be fried and so on and so forth. Um, Naha had gone through exercise very well. So this is just from the um, guidelines itself. So if you really look from the expert's recommendation from, based on that, if you're a healthy older adult, the diet should provide at least about one to 1.0 gram per kilogram body weight, okay? So that would be if you are healthy adults. Nevertheless, once you are sick or during chronic illness, your requirement is slightly high. And obviously, if you are in the critical care, the requirements are slightly different than this. It can reach up until two grams per kilogram uh, per se. So besides than just focusing on protein, I would like to highlight as well, just now we are looking into it when they are eating because all these things matters there's a study have shown if you're taking um, what we call it protein uh, food intake from the breakfast it really helps you with the intervention to bulking up the uh, bulking up the patients later so it's not just the protein and the requirement itself it's also you have to remember physiologically the food where you are taking and then how do you actually take and whether enough with mastication and chewing as well and that is also a problem when it comes to elderly patients so besides the just protein, there's some studies or more studies now are looking into impact of supplementation of amino acids. At that point, for this time, we are not just looking to muscle wasting during illness. At that time, there's not much studies looking into uh, enriched essential amino acids or beta hydroxymetabutyrate, whether that's going to improve patients, elderly who are maybe sarcopenics being in the ICU, or maybe just a normal that we are seeing in our normal medical wards. So what they have discovered from here, I wouldn't be able to find more in terms of a longitudinal intake of uh, supplementations that's going to be helpful, but at least there's a nice intervention that has been done. They're looking into effectiveness of nutritional supplement on sarcopenia and the recovery in hip fracture patients. So what did they have? So basically they have two groups, the intervention groups, they have a standard diet plus with the oral nutritional supplements or HMB, but the other groups on the control will have only standard diet. They look into uh, what we call it the bottle index and as well as the functional evolution categories. And what do they discover? So basically what they discovered, those in the uh, intervention group who receive HMB improves muscle mass and it actually prevents the onset of sarcopenia. And I think this is the thing that we have to consider whether if the patients really require it, because before we start into to use with the amino acids, we really look into um, what is the overall of dietary intake to begin with, okay? But nevertheless, this is a good findings to actually look for us in terms of we want to prepare the patients before or after. But bear in mind, there's also some updates on HMB this systematic review might not be a favor, but it's good for us to have a look. So what do they see is HMB uh, plus the most important key nutritional roles uh, when it comes to regulator of muscle protein anabolism. And they did a systematic review. You have to remember the amount or the numbers of studies among this is quite limited to begin with. Thus, it's not surprising when they look into it, they have done this um, meta-analysis, sorry, 
what they discover is HMB seems to produce no extra improvements to exercise in physical performance muscular strength. But I would like to take that note a little bit. As I mentioned to you, the number of studies is actually uh, quite minimal, but at the same time, it's actually, uh, at, at least this is a good evidence or value for us to see whether should we consider to all patients or very selective patients if we plan to give them with HMB. So my uh, conclusion, for today is few. First of all, nutritional factors is important, but as you can see from the three speakers just now, it can't stand alone. It requires multidisciplinary approach uh, that is want. And obviously from the uh, talks today, we discussed about how important to use your muscle. But what I'm more interested in the future, if you plan, if you are actually having programs in terms of incorporating physical activity, it should be also look into a personalized and targeted approach nutritionally for our patients that's going for surgery. Maybe now they are, but at the same time, in terms of rehabilitative, we have to look into it as well. And as I mentioned to you, all the things that we are doing in terms of nutrition, we need to reevaluate whether the patients before they come in, either the nutrition status was poor and that's getting better at the end or it's even worsened. So, Please evaluate is the most key important things as well. And progressive and some resistant exercise is also good to add for this. So this is where my final slide. What we are doing right now, diet physical activity, when we are in older life, we have to have a reflection how we are doing when we are in early life. However, it's not too late for us because whatever that we have learned from our reflection is for our future intervention. And this is where, even though we know you are actually prone to have diseases if from when you are from womb and then how's it going to be like when you're adults, but nevertheless, there's always window of opportunity for us to do intervention. And that's include with nutritional strategy as well. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thanks. Thank you ever so much, uh, Prof. Hazrin, and to uh, the other three speakers, um, if I may summarize um, and bang on time. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we've had a few questions um, through the uh, chat, which we could um, um, either speak out here. But just in summary, Dr. Terence Ong kindly introduced to us what sarcopenia is in terms of it being a geriatric syndrome and that uh, it affects uh, people as they age, and it does come with various adverse outcomes, but uh, it is not too late to prevent it when you're young, as early as your 40s. And, um, and training to rebuild your muscle is like training an athlete and becoming fit for surgery, uh, which Prof Kong had highlighted, was very, very important to reduce surgical post-operative, perioperative complications. And in terms of new, uh, intervention, we need a very strategic multidisciplinary um, uh, plan in order to uh, prevent all the adverse outcomes that come hand in hand when you intervene surgically in any older patient. And this is in terms of nutrition and a sports exercise program, which Prof Naha and uh, Prof Hazreen has uh, kindly um, uh, reiterated with regards to how we do this. Now, it's never too late. Uh, you are what you eat and we need to move. Now, um, I'd like to pose some questions here. I think based on them, I, we've had, I'll go backwards, if I may. Uh, Prof Tunkusara, who was the highlight of Prof Naha's um, talk earlier, has uh, specifically asked uh, Prof Hazreen, what is HMB? Hydroxy metabutyrate is actually part of, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier on, it's part of amino acids that is really helpful for your uh, protein build up or your muscle build up. And in Malaysia, currently the one that is being added is in your ensure goal. I think I replied that in, in the chat as well. Yes. Okay. Now, some of the questions uh, posed, we had two previous questions by Dr. Mohazmi and uh, Prof. Esther Wong. Uh, so I won't go in, into that. Just maybe a few questions to our panelists here. Um, and feel free to, to, to um, uh, reply any one of you. Um, I think uh, this is the building blocks of an interdisciplinary multi, 
uh, multidisciplinary uh, strategic program, which you're going to pilot. So what are the next steps? If I, perhaps I could invite Dr. Terence Ong uh, to, to reply. What are we going to do now with this program? How are we going to start? How are we going to start? I think that there's always a push and pull element to any new development. I think certainly from a geriatric medicine perspective, we are very keen to support in any way possible. I know from a colorectal side, they are interested to try and make something happen. So I think discussions are ongoing and to see how we can deliver, uh, deliver a, a more organized collaborative service and try and embed some research work into it. So discussions are ongoing. So watch this space, I guess. Excellent. I'm very excited as well. And um, I think it's timely. And, um, and I'm very heartened as a geriatrician that, you know, um, we are working very, very closely with um, especially surgeons. Um, and uh, this collaboration can only bring great things uh, towards the research element of this project. Now, uh, Prof Kong, you mentioned that um, a CT scan can assess sarcopenia and um, that we can look at the CT scan of musculature at L3 level. Now, why specifically L3? Yeah, thanks for the question, Cheryl. Um, it's because it's um, a modality that has been validated um, and um, it, there has been studies looking at the reproducibility of it and the validity has been looked into and it's been decided that the L3 vertebral level is the, the place to measure the muscle bulk. Um, there are various ways of doing this with um, various um, computer algorithms. Um, so obviously this involves radiologists, um, but certainly what we are trying to look at here in UM, what Terence actually's project is about, is trying to see whether could we um, be able to and determine sarcopenia even without CT, which obviously one is costly and two, there's radiation involved, um, and it rather use something which is a little bit easier um, to get access to, for example, using ultrasound. Um, so that's certainly what Terence has been focusing on, and I could actually get him to address some of this question. Right, Dr. Terence. I think it's an exciting one where uh, Prof Kong's already alluded to that from a colorectal perspective, all of your patients would have had CT, which makes it a, a readily available uh, screening modality. What is lacking is how well it validates with, say, the AWGS criteria. And I know locally in UM, we do have some expertise in using it. We have had discussions with radiology colleagues who have used some of these L3 uh, level musculature measurements to correlate with muscle function. So again, back to my first uh, response, which is, I guess, watch this space. It is very exciting what we could do collaboratively. Excellent. And um, I know for a fact that um, currently, um, especially for colorectal surgical patients, um, Prof Naha and Prof Kong work very closely in order to do some pre-operative work up to certain patients and I speak from personal experience because my father had colorectal cancer diagnosed end of last year and both of them um, had worked on him very closely prior to it and with much success thankfully and could you just um, explain currently prior to we are starting this um, pilot rehab program what were you both doing uh, for your patients uh, uh, pre-operatively uh, Prof Kong and Prof Naha. Um, thanks, Prof Cheryl. So um, pre-operatively, from my perspective, um, I um, would like to determine what the level of fitness that patient is. Um, as I alluded before, um, it's about stratifying risk. Um, if we know that a procedure is going to be fairly extensive, um, then we need to know what kind of risk is subjected to that patient in terms of morbidity and mortality. And prior to using sarcopenia as a marker, we've worked together using a parameter known as VO2 max and also anaerobic thresholds to try to give us an objective measurement um, as to the risk involved for that patient. 
Why is it important to determine risk? It's because one that's important for patient counseling and patient consent, they need to understand the, the level of um, invasiveness and what the potential outcomes could be. Um, for a surgeon, it will also determine whether is that patient suitable for curative treatment or is it best managed palliatively? And if that's suitable for curative intent, then when we've resected the bowel, what should we do about the two ends? Um, will the patient tolerate significant, com uh, significant morbidities post-operatively, like for example, anastomotic dehiscence? And if they're not, then they will have to be counseled in regards to a non-restorative procedure, i.e. like a stoma for the rest of their lives. So it does really have a huge impact on what we offer to the patient. Um, we unfortunately don't have time today to bring an anesthetist on board, but we also have some anesthetists um, who have been very um, strongly support, so they are strong supporters of this. And they think that it actually allows them to stratify how to use ICU beds appropriately for these patients, whether they need to have more intensive monitoring. So it spans all across the board, actually. If we actually identify patients at risk earlier, then we can actually intervene at appropriate stages throughout the patient journey and therefore offer the most appropriate treatment for that patient, lessen the mortality and lessen the morbidity from, from surgery. So I'll pass this on to Prof Nahai and he may be able to tell you a bit more about what he does for these patients. Thank you. Um, of course, at the very beginning, um, Prof Kong approached uh, me in person in regards uh, how to go about and um, uh, intervene patients to improve their physical uh, fitness level prior to operation. So, of course, the uh, selection basically will initially done uh, by Prof Kong himself and then where patients at, you know, at the verge, not sure whether they are fit or not fit. And then at the same time, uh, we, we, we will discuss in terms of, okay, what is actually their plan? Uh, if, if, let's say, they have time for the patient, then we will make a proper planning and then uh, we will uh, start building up uh, gradually. As I mentioned earlier, um, patients will come at different uh, physical activity level. So, of course, at, 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 at this point of time, um, the assessment uh, which uh, we are currently involved is with cardiopulmonary exercise test, testing or VO2 max. Um, uh, of course, we are looking at NMB threshold and also uh, the VO2 peak uh, and also uh, other, other parameters. So we, before we start doing the test, um, definitely we, we will assess um, uh, 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 the patients able to perform the test. So most of the time we will, we will have some kind of familiarization because at the very beginning from our exper experience when we first started earlier two years ago, um, most of the time of course patients are not familiar and then we need to give them familiarization and uh, even without using the mask but just started them with uh, sitting on a bike or arm ergometer because you know if you are again, not familiar with the activity, uh, it will be uh, uh, difficult uh, for them to perform at their best level. So before going for the assessment itself, we will screen out, make sure that patients basically safe uh, prior to the assessment. So we have uh, our assessment tool where we will screen to make sure that patient fit for the test or even before the test itself, if uh, patient uh, not uh, uh, possible, then we will do other basic assessment like six minute walk test. And then we will tell, we will discuss, okay, this patient is basically uh, only able to perform this, unable to perform that test that we require. So maybe we need to think about uh, whether there's opportunity for the patient to get them self improve uh, before we start doing the test because, you know, it's, um, um, when you do test at the first time, when patients are not familiar, definitely they will perform not very well at their best level. So that's where we are in a discussion on that. And of course, with the results, we will plan out, okay, how much we can improve. Uh, and then it will depend on patients at the same time. If they 
um, able to commit. And I'm sure, uh, like Prof. Sharos, uh, that uh, he's very determined. And then um, he actually, after uh, uh, four weeks of intervention, he, 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 he managed to get a result with flying colors. So, and in the end, uh, his operation uh, came out to be very successful. And we also have patients that first time, the old lady at 81 years old, she physically inactive, but we started her with something light and then increasing gradually and monitor and supervise her. She come to the clinic. Um, but uh, unfortunately, she can't come uh, continuously because of some um, uh, difficulties. But in the end, we did assessment, even though despite the test, assessment not as much as what we uh, would like to uh, get but patient has a trend of improvement so from then itself uh, I give a, 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 my uh, observation opinion to Prof Kong that so this uh, patient is uh, a good candidate for uh, operation and then it turned out the result was also good and then which is actually, again, coming back to the earlier stage, where it's, uh, it's actually uh, better to do something rather than nothing at all. But of course, patients need to be compliant and committed. Um, like this, the lady, 81 years old, even though she didn't turn up uh, for the last three weeks before the assessment, but she's still doing it at home. Only that is good things that if she comes regularly uh, every week, then the intensity or the, the level might able to be increased and she may achieve a full uh, optimum of uh, results prior to the uh, test. Thank you all. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. And um, thank you for the participation. Thank you for the questions. Now, if I if any of you have any burning questions that arise after this, uh, do contact the speakers at their personal, uh, their, their uh, UMMC or UM email. Uh, we will share the attendance list as usual. And um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all the speakers. Now, by all means, this, this is by no means the end of the collaboration. The group can get, just get bigger and bigger and not only limited to, but this is a great, great start. And um, I would um, like to also uh, take the opportunity to wish everyone a happy new year. I really, really hope and pray that the, um, it will be a much better 2021 than it has been this past year, despite the challenges. I think we've grown closer as a faculty and we welcome uh, and embrace uh, the changes that will occur next year. Um, and um, keep fit, eat well, and um, stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>